as many of you know, I grew up in Lubbock, Texas. And uh, in Lubbock, Texas, there was a Christian bookstore. Thank you, Beth. There was a Christian bookstore called the Sentinel Bookstore. And it uh, was run by the Bailey family, Ron Bailey. Yeah, yeah, different Bailey, Carolyn. Uh, uh, but uh, it was <laughs> run by the Bailey family. And um, I can remember the very first Bible that I bought myself out of my money. I was 16 years old, and I had heard that the Harper Study Bible was the go-to Bible. And so I went to the bookstore to get me one. And I only had about 15 or 20 bucks, and they had one for about 15 or 20 bucks, but they also had this brown leather beautiful, beautiful Harper Study Bible, Revised Standard Version. And it was about twice what I had in my pocket, or it, to my name, because <laughs> everything I had to my name I had in my pocket. And, uh, uh, and I thought, you know, I can get this one, or I'll just save up and get that one. And Ron Bailey came up to me while I was doing this, and, and he, we went to the same church. He was a family friend, and, and, my, and, and he came up to me and he said, uh, Mark, have you figured out what you want? And I said, yes, I, I need a Harper Study Bible. I want a Harper Study Bible. I'm going to buy it. It's the first Bible I've ever bought with my own money. And he said, uh, how much you got? And I said, well, I've got enough money for this one, but I'm eyeing that one. And I'm thinking if I wait two weeks... I can save up enough to get that one. And he said, that's a great idea. That's what you should do. And I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. He said, now, would you take that one home for the next two weeks so you can try it out so when you come pay for it, you'll know how good it is. And, and I, said, uh, I said, only if you'll take the money I've got right now and then I'll, I'll, uh, um, uh, I'll bring you the rest in two weeks. So I took that Bible home, and, and that Bible was my Bible for the next multiple years, well over a decade. I took that Bible to school. I made my notes in the margins of the, that Bible. Uh, I took notes during sermons, not on a little sheet. I'd take notes during sermons in the margins of that Bible. I loved that Bible. I made so many notes in that Bible. I taught so many lessons out of that Bible. That Bible, for well over a decade, was my spiritual handbook. I read through the Bible, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, the very first time, out of that Bible, making my notes. I did prayer requests in that Bible, in the Psalms. I did testimonies of God's faithfulness in the margins of that Bible. I had so much in that Bible that it occurred to me as a young lawyer that I ought to make a Xeroxed copy of every page that had notes on it because I have been known to lose things. <laughs> really badly. And so I just put it down. That's one of the things I'm going to do. And it was on my to-do list when I lost that Bible. And... I just thought, somewhere that Bible's coming back. I mean, you can't do... God, you owe me that Bible for the good of the kingdom. But I've got to tell you, it hadn't come back yet. It's been about 25 years now. That was two churches ago. And I can't remember whether or not I have my name in it. But if you've got a brown Harper Study Bible with a lot of notes inside, please give me a call because I really want it back. There's something special about God's Word, isn't there? Not just as a coffee table book. And it's not when it's got the brown leather binding. It's not even when it's got your own notes. There is something really special about the Bible itself. And I love that Bible. I love 
this Bible, this is an English Standard Version, hard copy. I learned not to buy the leather covers. You just lose them anyway. Um, but there's something really special about having that Bible and holding that Bible in your hand. Because when you've got that Bible in your hand, you know you've got something extraordinary. It's not just a book. It's not just the musings of spiritual people. It's called Holy Scripture because it's uniquely fashioned. And that's a tenement of our faith. Now, my question to you and my challenge to you this morning is, how do we know that this book we love, these words that we treasure, how do we know that this is even remotely what the Bible was originally written to be? Or how it was, who picked these books to go in here? Who kept out the other books? What about those sensational things we read and hear about in the media? Discovered lost scriptures. The gospel of Judas. The book of the marriage of Mary and Jesus. You know, what were there these lost scriptures that have now been discovered? These are the questions that, that dig uh, uh, that, that, that we dig into the roots of church history to, to do, to answer. And at first blush, if you've just got some sensational article, you might be concerned. After all, I've heard this argument made. Here we are today, we're holding a Bible. We can go back and realize the New Testament autographs were written between, say, 50 and 100 A.D. So in that time range, they were written. Now, if I were to ask you, or you were to ask me, what is the earliest complete copy of the Bible that we have? That doesn't have to be every page, but reasonably every page. What's the earliest we've got? The answer would be Codex Sinaiticus. Let's break that apart for a moment. Codex is an ancient word. It is a book that's made of handwritten pages. Not a book of printed pages, but from a printing press, but a book of handwritten pages. Codex, a book of handwritten pages, Sinaiticus. That's named that way because it was found on Mount Sinai in the 1800s by a German fellow named Tischendorf. Tischendorf is at the monastery searching for old manuscripts. The monastery is St. Catherine's. It's the oldest monastery that's been continuously operated. It dates from about 350 A.D. Tischendorf has been in the library, but he goes to his room for the night that the monks have provided him. And he's got some kindling for starting a fire because it gets cold at night in his room. So he puts in the logs and he gets the paper kindling and he puts, starts to put it in there and he glances at some of the sheets. He realizes this is Greek. He looks at it closer. He realizes this is the Bible. So he stops using it as kindling gathers all of the pages he can, and he winds up with the oldest complete manuscript of the Bible to this day that we have, and it dates from 350 A.D. They were using it as kindling. Now, here's the argument that I've heard. If the church believed that Scripture was inspired, if the church that believed, script, believed, the early church believed Scripture was so important, then why do we go 250 plus years of the early church with no Bible? 
interesting question. If the church believes Scripture was so inspired and so important, then how come we don't have any Scripture Bible for 250 years of the church? So I want to start by answering that question, and then we're going to go a step further. And this, uh, Bear with me. The answer to the question is actually built into the question itself. You might be surprised. It's because the church believed Scripture inspired and so important that we don't have complete early copies of Scripture. It is because the church treasured it that we don't have them. Let me explain what I mean. Um, we've got a family vacay planned this summer. Our family vacay doesn't take place till August, but we'll be gone, God willing, for a week in August. We're going to split Croatia. Has anybody ever been to Croatia? Wow, a bunch of you have. Okay, I'm really into food, so any restaurant recommendations, top drawer, okay? Split Croatia, if you go to Split, one of the things you want to see, I've been told, is the palace of Emperor Diocletian. Diocletian was a, actually he was born in Croatia, it was called something different at the time, but, but was the Roman emperor. He ruled from 284 to 305 AD. He built a palace in Split, Croatia, that is still there today. Diocletian was one of the last, well actually he was the last Roman emperor before Constantine, who strenuously uh, uh, attacked the church, persecuted believers, martyred the believers. In either late 302 or early 303, we're not quite sure, he issued an edict, he did a bunch of these, that any church that could be found had to be leveled. And the holy scriptures of the church had to be burned. And the believers of the church had to be persecuted. If scripture had not been so important to the church, if they'd just been an interesting novelette, or some devotional reading, it would not have made such a difference. But it was the fundamental backbone of the church, and as such, had to be destroyed if the church was going to be destroyed. Diocletian was not alone. You can go back before Diocletian, and you can read about another persecution that took place. There were these three women, three virginal women who had dedicated their lives to the Lord. Think none in today's terminology. Rather than pursue marriage and family, they chose to be devoted simply to God alone in a single life. Now, these three women were cornered to be prosecuted because of their faith and the fact that they had not burned their Bibles. And when they were asked why they didn't burn their Bibles and obey the law of the land, their answer was, it was Almighty God who bade us love Him unto death. For this reason we dare not to be traitors, but we chose to be burned alive or suffer anything else that might happen to us rather than betray them, the words of God, the Scriptures. You can go back in time to ancient Sirta, which is in modern Ethiopia. You go back to ancient Sirta, and in 180 AD, the persecution of the church is severe. The mayor is going through town trying to burn all of the Scriptures. And the mayor goes to the church official there in Serta and demands the Bibles to be burned. The, the, the church official 
gives his Bible to the mayor. The mayor's response is, why is there just one? The guy says, well, there's just one that I have. The mayor said, who else reads at church? Fella's not going to lie. Fella gives some names. Mayor goes to the next person. The next person has four copies of Scripture. Who else reads at church goes to the next one. The next one's got five copies of Scripture. Who else reads at church goes to the next one. The next one has eight copies of Scripture. The next one has seven copies of Scripture. The next one only has two copies of Scripture in a codex form, but has a bunch of loose papers as well. And then the last one has six copies of Scripture. All burned. All destroyed. These are singular villages, but it happened throughout the Roman Empire. And that's the reason why. In Carthage, July 17th, 180, we can date this under the persecution. The Roman authority grabs the church subdeacon and says, what do you have in your satchel? The deacon is being persecuted for being a Christian? If he doesn't have anything in his satchel, if he would destroy the evidence against him, what case could be made? Maybe one, but it wouldn't be as easy. It wouldn't be the slam dunk as when he opens up his satchel and says, I have these books, which are the Gospels. I have these epistles of Paul, who was a good man. Almost all of the makings of the New Testament there in his satchel. The man's put to the sword and his books are burned. It's repeated throughout the first several hundred years of the church on a huge basis. That alone accounts for Scripture being lost. Not to mention the ravages of time. That may look like an old Scripture an old page from an old Bible, but it's not. Look real close. That's a newspaper. Those are classified ads. That's like Chevrolet, Caterpillar. It must be the automotive section. Ford. But it's worn out. Can you imagine what old scriptures over 1,000, 1,500 years? Oh, I didn't tell you this. It's not like everyone had been out hunting for them either. The church was very satisfied with the church, what the church had as far as scriptures. Most people weren't reading until after Luther, uh, not Luther, Gutenberg invents the printing press in 1450. So it's not until the, I mean, the, the church is satisfied with the Latin scriptures that it's got. It's not worried about the Greek and Hebrew originals because the church is being done in Latin in the Western world. So, so it's not until the mid-1800s that anybody's trying to find those old scriptures. And in 1800 years, they degrade a lot. Needless to say, most copies we found have been found in Egypt, in that arid climate. Not in the Nile Delta, but in the arid climate of Egypt. So for example, there was discovered the John Rylands fragment. If you go to Manchester, England, you can go to the John Rylands Library, and they've got it on display there. And the John Rylands fragment is the oldest fragment that we know of, that we have of the New Testament. It dates from somewhere around 115, maybe 118, to 135 A.D. Most scholars dated in that range. Now that's pretty remarkable when you consider the Gospel of John was probably written in Ephesus way up in Turkey around 100, 95 to 100 A.D. Somehow within 15 to 25 years a copy makes its way all the way down to Egypt such that it survived to this day. And uh, 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 we've got other fragments as well but we don't have that complete text. 
Now, that's not to say we couldn't make a complete Bible from earlier things. We could. One of the places where we could make the most New Testament out of are writings of the early church fathers that we've already been studying. Because they quote Scripture so much, they quote almost the whole New Testament. So we've got remarkable resources, but we don't really have good copies of Scripture until after Constantine the Great. He ruled between 306 and 337. Constantine the Great is the gentleman, the ruler. We'll, study, we'll dedicate a whole class to him. But Constantine the Great is the one who made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. By the way, most of you are not working today, right? If you do not have a job that requires you to work today, raise your hand. Thank you, Constantine the Great. He made Sunday a national holiday for religious purposes. It was not until he made that decision and that rule. We've still got it today. So Constantine the Great, before he died, he ordered 50 volumes of the Bible. He wanted it with ornamental leather bindings, easily legible and convenient for portable use to be copied by skilled calligraphists. Well, not reigned, trained, sorry, typo. Well, trained in the art. Copies, that is, of the divine scriptures, the provision and use of which you well know to be necessary for reading in church. That's a quotation from the biographer of Constantine, Life of Constantine, by Eusebius. A contemporary. A contemporary. Now, here's what he does. He orders these 50 volumes. Look at this. You know, it's, it's an amazing process. If I wanted to make a copy of my Harper Study Bible, I would take it to a Xerox. Well, they're not called Xerox machines. They're called copy machines. But in my generation, they originally were made by Xerox. So we say Xerox. Um, a copy machine. You put it down there and you make copies. You might scan it. Put it onto a jump drive. You just download it off the Internet. But back in that day, if you wanted to make copies, there were two main ways to do it. One is, Richard, I need you up here. I get Richard up here. I give him a sheet of paper and, I say, and a pen. And I say, Richard, I want you to take this down. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. You got that so far? In the beginning. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's go back. Let's go back. Put a comma after beginning. Capital G, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth, period. Okay, this is just not going to work. Go sit down. See, it's going to take way too long. How am I going to get 50 copies like that? I got a better idea. Take a sheet of paper, row leaders, section leaders, what'd you call them? Section leaders, take a sheet of paper, pass it down. Let's get about 50 people going. 50 well trained people. Now, all 50 of you, make note in the beginning, comma. And that was in a scriptorium. And they would have the scribes lined up on desks and someone up at the front would be reading. Some were better spellers than others, and so some of the old copies have misspellings. Some heard better than others, and some of the old copies have mishearings. And the wild part is, is after Mark Wilkie does his copy, then 20 years later, someone's going to take his copy and they're going to read it for another 50 people to copy. And the mistake he made is going to be in all 50 of theirs plus a few more that they made along the way. So we'll talk about that some next week on, on how we can rely upon what's being there. But suffice it to say 
that there are thousands at this point in time of ancient Greek manuscripts such that scholars are able to put them together and figure out with an amazing accuracy what the originals would have looked like. They can assign rows to people. They can say, this whole set of fragments we found over here, they all belong to that western division over there. It's that section. That section leader over in the west had a lisp. And it's apparent from the way his writers wrote what they were dictated. Bless you, Kelly. So, in the process of this, these are done. Now, if you go back in time to an earlier time before Constantine, the church can't just go willy-nilly and hire the scriptoriums to do this. It's done by the devout people in the church. And so those earlier copies are not by professional scribes all the time. And you can look at them and you can see that people were trying really hard. But it's not just... And there's a whole science behind all of this. But it's been done. And so we have Codex Sinaiticus from 350 A.D. And the fact that we don't have anything before that as a complete Bible, we've just got fragments, doesn't mean the church didn't treasure it. The church did treasure it. If the church didn't treasure it, it wouldn't have been around in 350 A.D. So asking that question, if the church believes Scripture was inspired and so important, why no older copies? Because it was so important to the church. Now let's take Codex Sinaiticus and let me tell you about another codex we have. By the way, there is a hefty number of really smart scholars who think Codex Sinaiticus is one of the 50 that Constantine ordered. Some scholars think a second one of the 50 is another almost complete Bible. It's called Codex Vaticanus. Not as many scholars will go that way because it looks like it's about 25 years after Codex Sinaiticus. And if you're wondering how they date it, they do it by font. You know, there are fonts and font changes, and, and they do it by font. It's a, it's a whole artistic thing. But anyway... Codex Vaticanus, was dis it's another codex, it gets its name because of where it was discovered. It was not discovered on Mount Sinai, it was discovered in, y'all are so good, in the Vatican. By the way, if you ever get curious, find Sharon Rim. Sharon, are you here this morning? I don't see Sharon here this morning. Sharon Rim's the librarian at the library. We've got dead on really, really good facsimile copies of both Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. They're under lock and key. Codex Vaticanus, the Vatican only made 50 copies that they would let out of this. Signed by John Paul II, by the way, on Christmas Day. But, but you can go look at it, tell Sharon unlock it, say, I want to look at it, I want to turn those pages myself. And you can... And if you turn them right, you're going to find this page in Codex Vaticanus. This is a page from the book of Hebrews. It's written in what are called uncils. These are all capital letters. Actually, that, yeah, those are all capital letters. And in the process of writing it, other people come along over the centuries since and they make little edit changes. They think, ah, scribe left out that word. Ah, scribe misspelled that. And they'll make little changes over the next 100, 200, 300, 700 years later. There's a scribe who makes a change to a word. Thinks that the, 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 the scholar had written the wrong word down and changes it. Wrongly. It was right the first time. And some monk comes along and reads it. And the monk gets upset. And the monk writes a note in the margin right there. Amathestate kai kake afestone. See it? Let's make it a little bigger. I'd like to translate it for you. This is what the monk said in the margin of 
one of the two most valuable Bibles in the world today because someone dared to change a word of Scripture. It says, Stupidest and wicked man, leave the original. Don't change it. <laughs> now you may be saying, that's not the stupidest. Yeah, well, Amos the state, he put his on two lines, so I just followed his. So his word stupidest is what looks like the first two words. He just didn't use a dash. Stupidest and kake means wicked man, evil man. Stupidest, most stupid and evil or wicked man. Aface tone, aface is you leave tone the pop lay on. Palaon, you leave the original. Me, metapoe, don't, different, make it. That's what he said. Now, that's, that's, that's pretty good stuff. This is not just something that the church was, you know, oh gee, maybe this is useful. Now, next question. Who decided? What goes into the New Testament and what doesn't? Next week, God willing, our plan is to talk about how that decision was made. Not how, but, but when that decision was made. And what went in and what didn't go in and why it went in and why it didn't go in. That's my tentative plan next week. Maybe we'll talk about some of the books that make the news today that didn't make the New Testament then. And we'll look at that. But who decides what goes into it and what doesn't? Now, if you read skeptics like Bart Ehrman, Bart will write books for the popular press that are basically like a National Enquirer article in book form, a tabloid. And he'll say, you know, it's, it's ridiculous to think that the New Testament is authentic, because either God did it or man did it. And if God did it, it shouldn't have any problems in it. And yet, we can see these spelling mistakes that have been made by scribes. So he says God couldn't be responsible if there's a God because surely he'd have made sure his word didn't get changed. Every vowel would be important. Then he says, so that just leaves man. So the Bible's a product of man. And that's what Bart Ehrman says. Bart Ehrman would say, who decides? Is it God or is it man? And Bart Ehrman, with all due respect, um, is asking a loaded question. He's asking an unfair question. He's asking an unbiblical question. The answer to that, who decided what goes into the New Testament and what doesn't? God or man, the answer is both. God works through people. It's always been that way. It'll always be that way. Let's look at a couple of passages of Scripture to show you that's what Scripture itself says. We'll start with Romans 3.2. In Romans 3, Paul is talking about the differences between Jews and Gentiles. And Paul's reached a point where Paul has said that the Jews haven't really cornered the market on a lot of things that they thought they had, including righteousness. So then Paul asks the question, okay, if the Jews have not cornered the market on righteousness, then what's the advantage of the Jew? What's the value of being Jewish, of circumcision? Paul says, there's a lot, much, in every way. Number one, to begin with, the first thing that Paul brings to mind for the advantage of the Jews, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Now that says it's God and man. God's oracles, the word of God comes out, but it was entrusted to Jews. And sometimes the people to whom it was entrusted might make copy mistakes. 
Sometimes they might write something in the margin. I'll tell you, if you have handwritten scriptures, if we have handwritten scriptures that say, um, let, you know, Pastor Avery this morning quoted Psalm 150, let everything with breath, Praise the Lord. Whoops. With breath. Come on, come on, come on, back out. There we go. Let everything with breath praise the Lord. Uh-oh. I left out the. There. Let everything with breath praise the Lord. Now, the next person who takes this is going to sit there and say, let everything with breath praise the Lord, hopefully, and fix it. But it's very possible that, that I might have done something else. Let everything with breath praise the Lord and I might be reading that in my Harper Study Bible as a 20-year-old man, praying it, and I might say, Amen! So I remember, Amen! And then the next person comes along, 20 years later, and thinks, okay, that says, let everything with breath praise the Lord, Amen. So the guy forgot to put Amen at the end. And all of a sudden it creeps into the next copy. See how that happens? Now, that doesn't mean that the oracles of God were bad and that God did a bad job of ensuring that His Word would stay. I mean, we've got other copies that show exactly how it changed and everything else. Nobody's got any dispute. That's just the fact that God and man have been involved. God entrusted Scripture to humans. And God has, you know, it's kind of like there's this baby in the church service in front of me. His name was Kazan. And Kazan decided that he wanted me to hold him. And so I got to hold baby Kazan. And Kazan started Kaysen decided he wanted to go for a walkabout. So Kaysen gets started. Now, Kaysen's mama let me hold Kaysen. She did look twice when she realized I was taking him and leaving. But she let me leave knowing that I could be entrusted with that baby and I would bring that baby back in a reasonably safe condition where no harm has fallen the baby. In fact, after walking with me for about five minutes, he delivered a gift. <laughs> and I took him back to his mama. There, God doesn't just put his scripture out to people that cannot be entrusted with it. If you go back and look at so many of the Old Testament laws and rules and guidelines and instructions, some of those were in place by God so that the Hebrews would do a good job at keeping his oracles entrusted and that were entrusted to their care. And so it's, it's God, God kept a measure of control over it but it's still something that, that's with both. Now, that's not just the text itself, but if we go back, you know, you're already at your head of me. No, you're right, you're right. I didn't, I, sorry, I should never have said go back. You guys are so much faster than I am. Who decides what's going into the New Testament and what doesn't? It's God and man. It's both. Now, how do they make that decision? And then we'll see the implications of it next week. First of all, at the time of Jesus, there was Scripture. There were oracles of God. We in the Christian church call those oracles the Old Testament. If we were Jewish, we would call them, anybody, the Torah is the first five books, but the entire Old Testament, the Tanakh. Okay? They had scripture. And it was an oracle of God because it had been delivered by prophets. 
And God had set up these strenuous guidelines on how you know if a prophet's real. And if the prophet's not real, you kill them before they have a chance to pollute things. And so Moses said, there's going to be another prophet that's going to come. Moses gives the Torah, but beyond him there's going to be another prophet. And the early church knew that that prophet was Jesus. Acts 3, 22 and 23, it's specifically said by Peter. He doesn't leave any doubt about it. Jesus is that prophet. Um, Acts 3, 22 through 23. It's worth showing for a second. Moses said, The Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. There is a prophet, and it was Jesus. And it's very clear if you continue to read Scripture. In Acts chapter 20, we read it. In 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 12, 1 Corinthians 9, 14. In these places, Paul is referencing the word of Jesus as the word of the Lord. <laughs> Um, that's interesting. The word of Jesus as the word of the Lord, and the organ plays. <laughs> Clearly not a church of Christ. Um, <laughs> so you've got the Old Testament prophetic scriptures, and then you've got Jesus. Now Jesus goes a step further. If we're going to believe Jesus, Jesus says to his apostles, in that same soliloquy or, or dialogue that, that Pastor Avery was preaching from today, he says in John chapter 14, when the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to remind you of the things that I've said, the things that I've taught. He's going to teach you the meaning of it, and He's going to guide you and give you the words so that you can bear witness to it. And so we have an apostolic inspiration where the apostles themselves were not simply chosen because Jesus needed a good round number of 12 to fill out a table for Michelangelo, not my, Da Vinci, uh, who painted the Last Supper? Leonardo Da Vinci. For Da Vinci's Last Supper. And yes, Bob, you could tell your joke. Bob said, uh, you can tell right before this happened what the words were at the Last Supper. And I bit the first time he said, what? And I said, what? He said, Jesus said, Okay, everybody, on this side of the table for the picture. Um, that's almost irreverent. Not quite, but almost. Only because Jesus had a sense of humor. Is that not irreverent? So, so you, you've, got, you've got those 12 chosen because those were the ones that received the promise from Jesus of the Holy Spirit to remind them, to teach them, to guide them, for them to bear witness to the words which is what they did. And that's what our New Testament scriptures are. So we have in the New Testament the words of Jesus recorded by apostles, directly or indirectly, along with other writings that the apostles themselves either produced or blessed and contained their teachings. And those are the holy writings. Now, if anybody finds my Bible, please, I'd like it back. Here are your points for home. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay Him? For from Him, God, and through Him, God, and to Him, God, God are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. I love that passage out of Romans. And I love that passage as we look at this because it tells me something. I'm going to treasure Scripture because in Scripture the mind of the Lord has been revealed. In Scripture we have the oracles of God. 
I don't worship Scripture. I worship God and Him alone. I worship Jesus. But it is through the oracles of God that we understand and perceive the truth of who Jesus was and what Jesus did and who Jesus is today and what Jesus will do today and in the future. Peter, look at this passage. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you. Peter referencing Paul's epistles. As our brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. As he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Now I think Peter had read Romans 9, 10, and 11 because he adds this. There are some things in them that are hard to understand which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the, what's the last two words there? Other scriptures. Peter recognizing the writing of Paul, writings of Paul as scripture. Now some scholars will say, well, oh, 2 Peter wasn't written by Peter, it was written by the school of Peter after Peter had died. But they still got to give it a pretty early writing even if they're skeptical and don't think Peter wrote it. So the school of Peter, if you will, is saying the writings of Paul are Scripture. You know, I'm going to live by Scripture. Uh, there are lots of things you can use to decide how you want to live. I'm going to go ahead and just take these words and try to live by them as best I can as I understand them in today's culture and life. Last. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is great. So I'm going to treasure God's word. I'm going to live by God's word. And I'm going to experience the same work of God that ensured His Word for the ages is at work in us. And I'm going to experience that, and I pray you will too. I hope you're working on your John. Some are, some aren't, some kind of are. That's okay. This is not a guilt trip. It's an opportunity. So do some work on it. Would you let me bless you before we go? Lord, I ask your blessings on my friends here today. And I ask you to touch their lives and their hearts. I pray, Lord, that this won't all be head knowledge. But, Lord, I don't want to leave our brains behind. I think it's, it's, it's a blessing that we have from you. That we have these scriptures that we can read. And, Lord, we should have confidence in them because you have worked through the ages to ensure them for us. So I pray, Lord, that you would bless us with confidence in your word, that your words will transform us as we seek to be like Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for our time together. In Jesus we pray. Amen.